Today's video is sponsored by Squarespace. Today we're gonna to look at a crazy prime generating function. And I built this out of results from Willens and Hardy and Wright. So they each had kind of their own prime generating functions and I just like smashed them together. So nothing super fancy is going on here. And also like, as we'll see, this is not a very useful prime generating function mostly because it's not efficient. Notice it involves like uh, taking a factorial of a number. And if you're working for with large primes, well, taking factorials are computationally expensive. Okay, but let's dive into our result. Okay, but let's look at our result. Okay, so that being said, I think it's still pretty interesting. So let's look at this result. So we'll define the function p of n to be one plus the sum is m goes from one to two to the n of the floor of the nth root of n over the sum as k goes from three to m of, let's see what we have, k minus two factorial minus k times the floor of k minus two factorial over k. So there's a bunch going on there, but we'll work carefully from the inside out. And just to be really clear, our claim is that for n bigger than or equal to 2, p of n is p sub n, the nth prime number. But I think this is okay. This covers all prime numbers except for the first prime number. But I think we all know what the first prime number is. Okay, so along the way we'll use Wilson's theorem. And in fact, a lot of these prime generating functions are built out of Wilson's theorem. That says that p is prime if and only if p minus two factorial is congruent to one mod p. This is maybe not the standard way of stating Wilson's theorem, but it is equivalent. Okay, so let's get to it. We're gonna start by looking at the inner part of this inner sum. So in particular, we're gonna pay attention to k minus two factorial minus k times the floor of k minus two factorial over k. Okay, nice. And we'll do this case by case. So let's start with the case when k is equal to p, I'll call that a prime. So what does that tell us? That tells us that p minus two factorial is congruent to one modulo p. Okay, but that tells us that p minus two factorial is equal to a times p plus one, where a is some integer. That's essentially just the definition of congruence mod p. Okay, good. But now let's look at this object right here. So we've got p minus two factorial over p. We're taking the floor of that. But notice that that will be the floor of a plus one over p using that expression for p minus two factorial. But a is an integer, one over p does not get us to the next integer, so the floor of this is simply a. Okay, but now we're ready to put this together. So our k minus two factorial will be p minus two factorial, and then we'll subtract p times, well, the floor of this, but we determined that to be a. So we'll subtract p times a. But notice that that's exactly, but notice that's really similar to this expression right here. If we subtract the a times p over to the left-hand side, we'll see that this is equal to one. Okay, so what did we get out of this? Well, let's collect our data up here. So this is equal to one if k is prime. Okay, nice. Now let's move on to the next case. And you might think the next case is simply the case when k is composite, but it won't be. It'll be the case when k is equal to four. And that's because this factorial object does something different when you're working with four than you're working with anything else. Okay, so anyway, let's look at this k equals four case. Well, in that case, we can just like plug it into this expression. So we'll have four minus two factorial, which is two factorial, minus four times the floor of, well, that'll be four minus two factorial, which is two factorial over four. But notice two factorial over four is a half. You take the floor of that, you get zero. So you get two factorial minus zero, so you get two. So this is two if k 
pay is equal to four. Before we continue, I'd like to thank today's sponsor, Squarespace. Are you ready to take your online presence to the next level? Squarespace is here to help you build a stunning website that reflects your unique vision. With Squarespace, you can create a website that stands out from the rest. It's simple, powerful, and beautifully designed. Whether you're an artist, entrepreneur, or blogger, Squarespace has all of the tools that you need to make your online dreams come true. Choose from a vast library of professionally designed templates that are not only visually stunning, but also fully customizable to reflect your unique style. The new Fluid Engine gives you complete control over the structure of your website. Squarespace's intuitive drag and drop builder allows you to create and edit your website effortlessly. No technical skills required. Every website you create with Squarespace is fully optimized for mobile, so your audience can enjoy your content on any device, anywhere, anytime. Use Squarespace's analytics to measure your website's performance and make informed decisions for growth. I use Squarespace for my website and find it easy to use with plenty of integrations. They even have a plugin for LaTeX that allows me to include equations on my website very easily. Whether you need a place to sell your merch or show your art, Squarespace has the tools that you need to keep your website modern and easy to use. Give Squarespace a try by going to squarespace.com, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash michaelpenn to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain using code michaelpenn. Thanks once again to Squarespace for sponsoring today's video. Okay, well, now let's look at the case when... K is some co composite which is not four. In other words, where K is not equal to four and not equal to a prime. So it's some composite that is not equal to four. Well, in this case, we'll have K minus two factorial is in fact equal to zero mod K, but let's work out why that's the case. Well, if K is not four or a prime, then that actually means we've got this nice factorization of K as A times B. And we can choose this A and B so they satisfy the inequality. One is less than A is less than B is less than K minus one. You might think that you can just pin it above by K, but in fact, K and K minus one are relatively prime. So that means you can go down a bit. Okay, so anyway, there we have it. There we have that factorization. But that means if we do k minus two factorial, what you'll get is, well, k minus two times k minus three, that'll descend all the way down. But along the way, you'll hit the number b and you'll hit the number a. But when you multiply those together, you get a times b, but a times b is equal to k, meaning this whole thing right here is a multiple of k, making it all congruent to zero mod k. But if it's congruent to zero mod k, that means that k minus two factorial over k is an integer. Okay, but if k minus two factorial over k is an integer, then that means when you take the floor, you get exactly what you started with. It doesn't change, because if you take the floor of an integer, you just get, well, the integer that you have. But that means that if you have this equation up here, well, the floor isn't doing anything. But that means the two k's cancel and everything cancels out to zero. So you get this result right here. So one if k is prime, two if k is four, and zero otherwise. Okay, so now that we have that set up, let's see what's happening with this sum. Okay, so there we have it. We're finding the sum of this thing that we have above, which we wrote in that kind of piecewise form over there. But that's gonna take care of all of the primes that are smaller than m except for two. So that's equal to, okay, so now we're ready to evaluate this sum using what we had found here. So notice every time we pass a prime, we'll pick up the number one. So at least part of this will be the number of primes from three up to m. Okay, but then when we go through the number four, we have to add another two on because we probably go through the number four, at least if m is large enough. So that's gonna add two on there. So it's gonna be the number of primes between three and m plus two. Oh, but like notice, that's the same thing as the number of primes 
between 2 and m plus 2 minus 1. And that's because we added one more prime in there. The number 2 is prime. Oh, but notice that all of the primes between 2 and m is the same thing as all of the primes less than or equal to m. But there's a name for that function. It's the prime counting function, which is denoted pi of m. So here we have pi of m plus 1. So there we've done it. We've reduced this sum to the prime counting function plus, plus 1. And this sort of object, this prime counting function or the prime counting function plus 1, is really one of the main tools for building these prime generating functions. And what differs from this formula versus Willen's formula is exactly how you express this prime counting function plus 1. So I chose to express it like this, which is a formula due to Hardy and Wright, although you could express it in this crazy like cosine configuration, which was the original way Willens did. Okay, so that being said, let's maybe take it from here to the end using the fact that we can switch out this sum with this object right here. Okay, so we did a bunch of work to get to this spot right here. So our prime generating function is equal to one plus the sum as m goes from one to two to the end of the floor of the nth root of n over one plus pi of m. Let's recall that pi of m is the number of primes less than or equal to m. Furthermore, you might say, well, why do we have this two to the n here? That's because there's a result that I think we proved on the channel before that the nth prime number is less than or equal to two to the n. So we need to go at least up to that point right there. Okay, so at this point, we're gonna split the sum into two pieces. So we'll have one plus, now we'll have the sum as m goes from one up to the nth prime minus one of, well, we've got this whole thing. So the floor of the nth root of n over one plus pi of m. So we've got something like that. And then next will be the rest of the sum. So that'll be the sum m from the nth prime up to 2 to the n of, well, it's the same thing. So the nth root of n over 1 plus pi of m. Now let's look at each of those individually, maybe starting with this one over here. Okay, so if m equals the nth prime, the nth prime plus one all the way up to two to the n, well, that tells us that pi of m is bigger than or equal to n. Well, notice how many primes are less than or equal to the nth prime? Well, there are exactly n. And then, well, every number than that is larger, so you know we're gonna pick up this inequality. Okay, but what does that mean? That means that n over pi of m plus one will be less than or equal to n over n plus one, which is in turn strictly less than one. But if that's strictly less than one, then when we take the nth root, it's also strictly less than one. And then we take the floor and we'll get zero. I guess we should point out here that this is clearly kind of bound below by zero. Okay, good. So again, we're taking the floor of something that's between zero and one, cannot include one. When you take that kind of floor, you'll get zero. So all of these terms are zero. So we might as well not worry about them. So I'm gonna get them off the board and we're gonna look at this first term. So we've only got a couple of steps left. Now let's look at this first term. So if m equals one, two, all the way up to the nth prime minus one, then that means that pi of m equals zero, one, two, all the way up to n minus one. And that's because we haven't hit the nth prime yet. So if you count the number of primes that are before the nth prime, well, you can't get to n. You can only get to n minus one. Okay, but let's see. That means that pi of m plus one equals one, two, all the way up to n. Okay, great. So now let's see where we go from there. So that means we have n over pi of m plus one is bigger than or equal to one. And I'm gonna maybe go ahead and throw the nth root on here. So the nth root of that is always bigger than or equal to one because the argument there is bigger than or equal to one because our numerator is 
bigger than or equal to our denominator by the argument that we've made so far. Okay, but then that will be bound above by the nth root of n over one. That's the smallest this thing can be. In other words, the nth root of n. But then the nth root of n is in fact bound above by two. And this may seem like totally tricky to show, but let's notice that this is equivalent to saying that n is less than or equal to two to the n which you can show a number of different ways, either with calculus or taking two to be one plus one and expanding it as a binomial. Okay, but that means if you take the floor of this, you always get the number one. So here we take the floor of this and we always get one. So that means we're adding one to itself PN minus one times. So this gives us one plus PN minus one Adding that together, we get Pn, this nth prime. Okay, so there we did it. We've got this prime generating function. And like I said, it's very similar to this formula by Willens, just with this like little tweak of using the hardy right formulation of the prime counting function instead of the weird cosine version of the prime counting function. Now, if you've stuck around and you haven't subscribed yet, maybe consider subscribing. It would really help us reach our super secret subscriber goal. And that's a good place to stop.